Well, I think we'll resume our business. We're, um, we're ready to start with leaders' questions. Tishik is on his way. Leaders' questions, understanding Order 36. We welcome the Taoiseach and we welcome Deputy Mary Lou Macdonald for the first question, please. Good morning, Taoiseach. Seven years ago, then Health Minister and your Fine Gael colleague, Simon Harris, promised that no child would be waiting longer than four months for scoliosis surgery. That promise was never met. And all of, the, of all of the broken promises by your government, I think it's one of the most callous. The fact is that there are now more children on scoliosis-related waiting lists now than when Minister Harris gave that commitment in 2017. And this has happened on your watch, Taoiseach. There remain, as of this month, 327 children on waiting lists for scoliosis-related surgery. This is not acceptable. The families and the children involved deserve better. Last night I met with them, I listened to their concerns, I listened to the tragic stories of those families, to the pain that their children are in, to the life-limiting state in which many of these children find themselves, and it is heartbreaking what these children and families must endure. They feel that they have been left down because government promises have been made and broken time and again. Mohin the Chauli Shogar Ligashias Eid Tishk Gawil Gyaltanishan Realtis Brishta Arish is Arishella. Two years ago in 2022, I raised the issue of children with scoliosis waiting years and years here in the Dáil. I visited Kappa Hospital, met with CHI management, I also met with parents and advocacy groups. The government subsequently committed to 19 million euros of additional spending on the promise that this would result in no child waiting longer than four months by the end of 2022. And that promise has also been broken. Astoundingly, the Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, informed the Dáil last night that he cannot guarantee that those 19 million euros were spent for the purposes for which they were intended. He doesn't know. The government doesn't know. What we do know is that far too many children are waiting and waiting and waiting. One such child is Kylie Ann from Donegal. Kylie Ann is 10 years old and she has been waiting five years for life-changing surgery, half of her young life. Kylie Ann's mother has challenged all of us in here to see Kylie Ann as she sees her, with love, to give her the chance and the quality of life that she deserves. And I think we should meet that challenge, Gown Gorla. And that's why our motion tonight matters so much, because these children deserve better. So, Taoiseach, will you agree to work with us, with the parents and advocates, to establish a task force that works? Will you work with us to achieve accountability and transparency? Will you work with us to put in place the plan that delivers finally for these children? And Taoiseach, there is an urgency to all of this. Every and all treatment option must be on the table for these children and young people. Everyone must commit to doing everything necessary to ending what is a scandal of children waiting for spinal surgery once and for all. Our motion sets out that plan to address all of these matters in cooperation with parents, advocates, clinicians and with you Taoiseach. So can I ask you, as a gesture of seriousness and goodwill, to withdraw your amendment to our motion this evening? Can I ask you to work collectively with us to finally crack this and get the job done? 
because the plan that we have set out is the plan that the families want Thank implemented. You, and as I understand it, Taoiseach, they are looking to meet with you to discuss that plan. Will you meet with them? Taoiseach, please. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> um, um, uh, I, I, I know from my own experience, um, having worked in medicine as a doctor with it, what seems a long time ago now, uh, that the problem of um, failure is not inadequate services when it comes to spinal surgery uh, and scoliosis and spina bifida surgery for children is one that goes back, sadly, generations, um, many more lifetimes than these children have yet experienced. And I absolutely guarantee you that if it had ever been an issue simply of money, uh, our political will, or how, or, or how much we care about this, it would have been resolved a long time ago. And I don't have adequate answers as to why it hasn't been uh, fixed, um, but I do intend to do anything I can to establish why not and to put things right. And you have my assurance on that point, Deputy, and I'd be happy to work with you, uh, provided it's in good faith uh, to deal with this issue, because it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a political football. And I know that's not your intention, uh, but I think there's others who would make it such. And we need to stand together against those and work together uh, to resolve this issue, which will take more than one government to solve, in my view. But at least, let's get started on it. Uh, at the outset, I want to acknowledge that there is no doubting the worry, anxiety and pain for many patients and families attending these services. A comprehensive patient safety review has been commissioned into paediatric orthopaedic surgery services. This is independent and is led by independent expert Mr. Nagam. Concerns initially related to the clinical outcomes of some complex surgery, including what appears to be a higher than normal incidence of post-operative complications and infections and two serious surgical incidents. This, of course, does not necessarily mean that somebody did something wrong. These may have been high-risk patients that other doctors wouldn't operate on, but we need to make sure we know the facts uh, before we make any further decisions. Two additional patient groups are now being included. Patients have been randomly selected for purpose of audit and patients who have been identified as potential cases of concern by other surgeons in CHI. Those directly affected have been informed and patient advocates have also been informed. After meeting with the patient with the paediatric orthopaedic surgeons, the Minister for Health has also determined that a dedicated paediatric spinal surgery unit should be established. Mr David Moore, a consultant surgeon, has recently been appointed to head it up. The Minister met with him in January. Senior staff have been appointed as a new unit and the Minister has requested that a task force be convened as soon as possible with an independent chair. The task force will include all stakeholders, including patient reps and clinicians. And this is a model that has worked well in other areas, like haemophilia and CF, for example. The Minister wrote to and invited all advocacy groups to meet with him and seeking their engagement and their views on terms of reference for this task force, which will have an independent chairperson. And he met with a number of the groups earlier this week. The Minister's invitation to meet those who did not attend or request separate meetings remains open. Uh, Mr Nayam has met with the Minister for Health, families and patient reps and other stakeholders, following which he finalised the terms of reference for his independent review. In addition to that, the Minister has asked HICWA, the independent patent, patient safety regulator to, regulator, to carry out a statutory review of the use of springs that were not Z-marked. Uh, in relation to at the waiting list, Deputy, just for, for your information, uh, we have significantly uh, increased the number of procedures being carried out. Just take 2019, we often use 2019 as a base year for comparison because it's the year before the pandemic, uh, 380 final, uh, spinal procedures were carried out. Uh, that went up to 509 uh, in 22 and 464 in 2023. So there has been a big increase in the number of procedures being carried out and waiting lists have gone down. As of the end of last year, 78 patients were on the active waiting list, which was a reduction. Uh, and 231 are awaiting spinal procedures. Uh, I'm advised by the Department of Health that, that Sinn Féin has miscalculated the waiting list figures. Uh, the claim that 327 children on the waiting list is incorrect, even if you include those who are only waiting a few weeks. Thank you, Deputy MacDonald. Well, ni smo no five ounces of scale show. Tosh is scanalock. Gwildini oga igfehev, is igfehev, is igfehev, agus igfulling chmarsha. Tosh is scanalock. Shin on 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 fuckle kiart a toy gest. 
I've, I've raised this personally, this issue here for a decade almost, and I know other colleagues have also. And it's time now to confess and own up to the fact that this is utterly scandalous, Taoiseach. The children in that degree of pain are left to wait and wait and wait. And more scandalous yet, that your Minister for Health could present himself last night and say he doesn't know where the 19 million euro that was to be dedicated for their treatment, he can't tell us where it went. So I, I'm not interested in a political football. The families and their advocates aren't in. We are interested in a credible, good faith response from your government. And that means accountability. And it means action. And it, it, it certainly is not acceptable that you can't answer basic questions around where the resources have Thank got. You, but let me repeat Turn again, Taoiseach. Will you withdraw the amendment? Will you take in good faith the plan that the families and advocates support? And will you meet with them to discuss that very plan. Thank you, Deputy Taoiseach, please. Thanks, thanks Deputy. It's, it's five more days. It's two more days in Mohormsha. August Tommy de Glerg, Nias Maolis. August Tommy de Glerg, and five Shinaretach. And, Deputy, um, I, I have met the patient groups uh, and I'm happy to meet them again. It's not my practice to organise meetings on the floor of the House, but I'm happy to meet them again as soon as there's a gap in my diary. Um, but there are different groups uh, and they don't all agree with each other. And you know how complicated it can be to deal with an issue. Uh, when you have different groups representing the same people with different perspectives on what should be done uh, and what should not be done. And acting in good faith, Deputy, means uh, being big enough uh, to admit it when you have got your numbers wrong, and it also means not uh, misrepresenting the Minister in the House. Uh, it is not the case that we do not know where the 19 million is spent. We know where it was spent, uh, provided uh, for an additional 204 healthcare professionals uh, working at least some of their time on spinal surgery in Temple Street, in Crumlin and Kappa. It provided for a fifth theatre, which is now open in Temple Street. It provided for an additional MRI and also for additional beds. What we can't establish for certain is, is how much of the 19 million uh, was spent exactly on this. So we need to find that out. Um, Thank you. Teacher. No, it's, no, it's not the point. Well, what, what, the deputy, the, what the deputy has used is misinformation about the waiting lists here on, on the House. And she's also claimed that the Minister said that he didn't know where the money was spent. That's not what he said, Deputy. 200 staff, more beds, a new theatre, and, 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 a, new, and a new MRI. And if you honestly want to be involved in helping us to deal with the solution, which shouldn't be a political football, okay. you need a different approach. Thank you, Tisha. Can, can, can we stop the heckling, members, please? We go now to Deputy Ivana Batchik, please. Can Corla and Tisha, upon taking office in December 2022, your stated aim was to make Ireland the best country in which to be a child and to improve well-being and opportunity for children. But there are far too many children in Ireland who are still being failed by the state today. And Tisha, I'm talking about children denied care in our health system, those children waiting on surgeries, those children who are lost in mental health services, or those children not receiving the care and support they so badly need. And no parent wants to make public the private pain of their son or daughter, but we're seeing so many who are utterly desperate, and some parents even driven to posting social media videos of their young children sobbing with pain through the night in a desperate effort to secure appropriate health care. Those videos are harrowing. It's even more harrowing to meet the parents, to meet the children, and to hear their stories. And as we know, in 2017, then Minister for Health Harris did make a commitment that no child would be made to wait more than four months for surgery. Yet, children are still waiting longer for spina bifida or scoliosis surgery now than when your government took office. And as my colleague Duncan Smith said in the debate last night, 78% of children are waiting longer than Sláinte Care target times for paediatric orthopaedic inpatient appointments, and 81% of children are waiting longer than that target for inpatient urology services. And of course, there's also outpatient waiting lists, and let's look at children's mental health services. Because yesterday we heard from the Children's Rights Alliance that your government deserves only an E grade, an unacceptable grade, uh, for three years in a row now on access to children's mental health services. Four years ago, your government made a commitment to end the admission of children to adult psychiatric wards. And yet now, despite successive damning reports from the Mental Health Commission, from the Children's Ombudsman and others, you've apparently rode back 
on that important commitment because the Department of Health has now acknowledged that in some cases children with mental health problems will continue to be admitted to inappropriate wards. And we know last year, 50% of those children so admitted, unjustifiably, was because there was no bed available in CAMS units. We know almost one third of inpatient CAMS beds were not operational in 2023 due to staff shortages. And the waiting list for a first appointment for CAMS stood at almost 4,000 children in July of last year. Tisha, this is a national disgrace. On so many fronts, we're seeing vulnerable children let down by state health services. It appears that your government has quite quietly abandoned commitments you've made on children's health. And it's not good enough to say it may take two governments to recover this. And I heard you say that in response earlier. There are things you can do now. The Irish Hospital Consultants Association has pointed to staff shortages as a real factor in driving unacceptable delays for children's services. So will you end the recruitment freeze, the embargo in certain grades in the health services? And will you therefore move to tackle these outrageous waiting lists and address the failings in the CAMS services that have been so, made so glaringly obvious uh, you, by Deputy. so many reports, uh, including the Children's Rights Alliance report yesterday. Tisha, please. So, um, <clears throat> thanks, Deputy. Ireland is a very good country uh, in which to raise a child. Out of 200 countries in the world, we're in the top 10 or top 20 in almost everything. Uh, we have very good uh, maternal and neonatal health services, among the lowest maternal mortality and infant mortality rates in the world. We have a very good education system with among the best education outcomes in the world. Uh, we have uh, introduced early years education and by uh, September the cost of childcare will be half what it was uh, when this government came to office. We have the free school books, we have the hot school meals. Um, we also get an A grade from the Children's Rights Alliance which you mentioned uh, when it comes to online safety and media regulation and the appointment of an online safety commissioner. Of the 16 matters they grade us on, uh, we're up in four. Um, the same in 12, down in none, and fail only in one of the 16. But I absolutely uh, believe that that's not good enough, because my ambition is something more. It's for this to be the best country in the world in which to be a child, bar none. Uh, and that is one of the things that drives my work in government uh, and drives the work uh, of this government. Uh, just in relation to the recruitment freeze, Deputy, um, just so you have the facts, I know, I know you do want to know the facts, not always the case in this House, but I know you're one of the people who do. Uh, since this government has come to office, uh, there are 26,000 more people working in our health service, in our public health service, uh, than was the case before. That includes 1,000 more consultants, 2,000 more doctors, 6,000 more nurses and midwives. And by extra, I mean extra, uh, not replacements. Uh, last year, during the year in which the recruitment freeze, freeze was in place, the total number of staff in the HSC increased by more year than any year in many years. 8,000 extra staff were hired by the HSC last year. And this year, during the so-called recruitment freeze, the HSC has the authority to hire an extra 3,000 staff. So those are the facts. But what we can't allow the HSC to do, which is what has done, happened in the past, is money is allocated for one purpose, it gets spent for another. Might be a worthy purpose, but that's not the point. And allocation is given to hire 50 of this type of staff in this area, and 50 staff are hired somewhere else for something else, all doing a really important job, I'm sure, but that's just not good enough. And I know the new CEO of the HSC agrees with me uh, and is making those changes. In relation to uh, children being admitted to adult psychiatric units, um, we stand over our promise, I restate it, and we are making progress in that regard, Deputy. Uh, in 2019, the year before this government came to office, 54 children were placed in adult wards. Last year, that was down to 12. Uh, so I think we're going in the right direction in that regard. I should say that all decisions to put a child in an adult ward are made by a consultant psychiatrist uh, with the interest of protecting the young person and their well-being. The majority were over 17. All, voluntary, all, who were voluntary, all were voluntary detained for a short period of time. And in some cases, the young people even turned 18 and transferred to adult care during their admission. No consultant takes the decision lightly. It's often done in consultation with their parents and I've been there, Deputy, and sometimes it does make sense for a 17-year-old or even a 16-year-old to be in a private room on adult ward than to be in a children's unit 200 miles away. Thank you, Tisha. Deputy Batchik. 
Well, Taoiseach, we're certainly ready to acknowledge progress where it's been made, and we've welcomed moves by government to review how additional funding for spinal surgery was spent by the VHI. That's important. But I'll say again, it's just not good enough for you to say it will take two governments to resolve issues as regards children's health in Ireland. You're in government. You've been in government for many years now, and it's not good enough that we're still seeing these waiting lists. And let's look at facts. The Irish Hospital Consultants Association tells us that the difficulty with filling permanent consultant posts is, what is a root cause of unacceptably long, their words, child waiting lists. In August last year, they told us over 100,000 children and young people were in hospital waiting lists, with 20,600 children waiting longer than a year for treatment or assessment by a hospital consultant. Latest HSE data reveals the number of unfilled permanent consultant posts has risen to a record 933. And the Irish Hospital Consultants Association say this is the highest consultant vacancy rate ever. These are the facts. Just as there are facts on the admission of children to adult units, psychiatric units, the commitment made by your government four years ago to end this practice, however we see 50% of those children admitted to an adult unit last year, this, did, this was done because no bed Thank was available you, in the CAMS unit. Unacceptable waiting lists for CAM services. Tisha, these are the facts, and your Thank government you, Deputy, has simply not done please. enough to address them. Tisha. Thanks, Deputy. Just, just to clarify one point, and I, I appreciate I, I wasn't clear. Uh, when I say it'll take more than one government to solve some of these problems, I don't mean two governments over 10 years. I mean that this government has a year to run, uh, and this problem is not going to be solved within, within a year. Uh, the opening of the new children's hospital next year and everything around that does create a once-in-a-generation opportunity uh, to dramatically improve paediatric health care in Ireland, uh, and I'm determined uh, that, should be, that, that, that should be the case. Uh, when it comes to consultant appointments, we have a thousand more consultants now in Ireland than we had when this government came to office. I think that's significant. Uh, there was a time when the number of doctors per head of population in Ireland was below the OECD average. It's now above the OECD average. That happened uh, during my party's uh, term in office. And the term vacancy, as used by the IHCA, is a misleading one. Because the people at home, when they hear vacancy, they think empty. Isn't that what vacant means? But of course, a lot of these posts are not empty. Uh, they're filled by locums, they're filled by people on contracts, or they're filled by agency. And that's for, and that's for a lot of different reasons. And, and a lot of the time, unfortunately, it's in peripheral locations where consultants, particularly Irish consultants, are not willing to work. And therefore, we, we rely uh, on people to come from other parts, other parts of the world uh, who are willing to work in places uh, that sometimes uh, Irish doctors Thank are you, not. Tisha. But I wish to clarify again, the recruitment restrictions that exist do not apply to filling consultant posts on a permanent basis. Now, Deputy Richard Boyd Barrett, please. Deputy Richard Boyd Barrett. Taoiseach, for some very considerable amount of time, People Before Profit has argued that we need a state construction company in order to address the absolutely dire housing and homelessness crisis and to deliver the housing we need, and in particular to deliver the social and affordable housing uh, we need to address that uh, crisis. The evidence for that uh, is manifold. Uh, the government has not met its own social housing uh, targets. It has not met its own affordable housing uh, targets. Uh, the National Residential Property Price Index today again confirms that private developers and the private sector uh, are still delivering housing that is getting ever more expensive. Up 4% last year, uh, the seventh month in a row that house prices have gone up. They are now above uh, Celtic Tiger uh, heights and something I wanted to, I've mentioned a few times in the last few weeks, uh, the private developers and private sector are not building family homes, three and four bedroom homes, they're building uh, disproportionately one and two bedroom because they can maximise profits and this is contributing directly to the rise in child and family homelessness. But if, as if all that wasn't enough evidence, we have more evidence today with good body stockbrokers, an unlikely source, confirmed that the private developers and private builders simply do not have the capacity to meet the housing requirements of the state. They state that the state's housing building sector has a distinct lack of scale, that the lack of scale threatens the attainment of Ireland's housing requirements. This, by the way, uh, for, uh, is further echoed in the ESRI report at the beginning of this year that says we don't have enough construction uh, 
uh, workers in order to deliver on the state's housing requirements. That we are probably uh, 15 to 20,000 construction workers short of getting to uh, the necessary levels of housing supply in order to begin to address the housing uh, crisis. Uh, good body elaborate the point when they say compared to England, the top 10 builders here are, bar are building far lower proportion of the housing we need, that only uh, five companies built more than 500 units last year, and that the Irish bu building and construction sector is dominated by small-scale builders that are building on average 34 units per year, simply not at the races in terms of delivering the scale of housing output, and particularly the social and affordable housing output, that we need to address the crisis. So I ask you, Taoiseach, do we not now have all the evidence that we need that the state has to have its own construction capacity, that private developers and builders are not capable of giving us the housing supply and particularly the affordable and social housing supply we need to address the dire and urgent housing crisis? Taoiseach, please. Thanks, um, thanks um, uh, uh, Deputy. First of all, the state does have a construction company. It's called the LDA. Uh, it was established in 2019. Um, it went off to a slow start, but it's really getting going now. You'll know Shangana in your own constituency, where hundreds of social and affordable houses are, are, be, are being built. You'd like to claim that there are none in your constituency, but there are hundreds being built, and they will be available quite soon for people to occupy. And I certainly hope when people do live there, you won't have the brass neck to knock on their doors and look for their votes, uh, because the LDA deputy is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a body you voted against the establishment of. And I've been sent, I've been sent, I've been sent a very long list by Deputy Carol McNeil just now, and indeed previously by Deputy Devlin, uh, of all the developments in your own constituency which you objected to. Um, on, on, ideo on ideological grounds, because they're built by a private provider, uh, and, uh, and uh, they were one beds and two beds. Yet, if you look at the facts, look at the homelessness, look at the housing shortage, the area that we need the most new housing in, in Ireland, actually are one beds and two beds. Yes, we need family homes as well, uh, but the biggest shortage uh, is for one beds and two beds. And these are the kind of things uh, that you and people who share your ideology uh, seem to regularly object to. Uh, Deputy, we built over 30,000 new homes in Ireland last year. Um, that's up from 20,000 when I first became Taoiseach back in 2017, up from 7,000 when my party got into office. We're scaling this up. We're scaling it up as, as fast as we possibly can. We're not willing to cut corners. We saw what happened in the past uh, when that was done. And I don't think it should be a case of public versus private. Uh, if you try to fix the housing crisis with just the public sector, you're putting one hand behind your back. And Deputy, I understand your position based on your politics and ideology and your entire your ideology is that pretty much all houses or the vast majority of houses should be built by the state. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think you'll build less and I think it will cost more. What we want is the public sector and the private sector working together. Uh, you're right about uh, the skill shortage. We know that's an issue. That's why Minister Harris in particular has led the charge in apprenticeships. We now have about 10,000 people becoming apprentices every year now, which I think is pretty extraordinary. Uh, and we also uh, have changed the work permit system and work visa system to allow more people with construction skills from outside of uh, the European Union to come here. And they're much needed uh, and they're very welcome. And we're investing in MMC, uh, Modern Methods of Construction, so that we can build homes much quicker. And, and you're welcome to come out to Churchfields in my constituency to see where Fingal County Council, a local authority, a public body, is building hundreds of new homes, social and affordable, um, using M MMC. And I would encourage councils um, that aren't doing that to do that. Um, the whole point of local government is autonomy, allowing councils to do different things. But there are very good examples of very good councils uh, best practice councils, and I would ask people to come out to Fingal and see what a local authority, a public body, is doing in my constituency using MMC, building hundreds uh, of social and affordable houses. The same in your constituency in Shangana, uh, which you always refuse to acknowledge. Deputy Boy Barrett. You've some brass neck. I've been campaigning for Shangana to de develop a public and affordable housing for 17 years. It was Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil on the council who wanted to insist that there would be some private development. It was people before profit that argued relentlessly the entire development, I wasn't talking to you. The entire development, the entire development should be social and affordable and we eventually won out against the resistance of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. But it has taken 17 years to finally deliver, and they're still not delivered, uh, 
the social and affordable housing on that site. 17 years. Uh, so, what we are saying is to supplement the lack of capacity in the private sector. So don't play at this either or business. We are saying, as good body are saying, the private builders and developers do not have the capacity. That's what they're arguing. And that we need, in order to ramp up our housing delivery and to deliver social and affordable housing, which your government is failing to do. It missed its social targets, it missed its affordable targets, and it is self-evident that the housing that is being built by the private sector is unaffordable. Average house Deputy. prices, 327,000. In my area, 620,000. Average rents in Dunleary, uh, now 2,400. In Dublin, 2,200. This is not affordable. We need a state control construction company to build up the capacity to build houses and to make them public and affordable. Um, Ken Corla, there, there's something I admire about the Deputy, and I do, I do mean this, I'm, I'm not trying to be smart here. Uh, Deputy Boyd Barrett is very articulate, uh, very passionate and performs really well in this House, but it's really obvious when you get angry, uh, not just pretending to be angry, when you're genuinely angry, and the way you spoke to Deputy Carol McNeill there was... was no, no, Deputy, 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 You don't want to be there, do you? No, but... No, I know. so why should she heckle me? No, but do you know what I'm going to say to you now, Deputy? Yeah? Uh, I get, I, I'm in this house four hours a week, sometimes five hours a week. Yeah. I get constantly heckled. Not by me. Sometimes by you, no, sometimes by you just no, as you are now, no, no, no. Uh, often by members opposite. And I've never talked down to somebody like that, particularly a female deputy across the way. I'm not, I'm not listening, I'm not listening to you. I said I wasn't talking Deputy, please. You, you, again, your brass neck. Do you not see the irony of it? I, I'm, I'm criticising you for talking down to Deputy Cara McNeil uh, for heckling her, and then you're heck, and you're heckling me. Like, and 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 is Chan is the deputy not out of order? He is out of Thank order. Thank you, yes. the deputy. Oh, there's a lot of people out of order. So, would you please? Anyway, let's deal with the please. substantive issue now that we've dealt with the nonsense. We're out of time. Um, what we need is more private and more public. The constraint is not who owns the company. The constraint is the workers with the skills and the materials. That's where the constraint is. Thank you very much. Can we go on to uh, the regional group, I think, and Deputy Sean Canney, please. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we, good we, we won't have any heckling from... I hope not. I hope not. My two colleagues here, I'll right, restrain them as best I can. Um, Taoiseach, uh, I just want to raise a particular issue that has arisen over the last couple of weeks. It's in relation to the um, special education training hours for national schools. And a circular has been issued by the department which has caused fear and anxiety and uh, among school principals, board of managements, parents. And it is in relation to the criteria by which the, these hours are being um, the criteria by which they're going to be assessing people, children, for these. And I think the biggest problem with it is that there is an absence of having um, the criteria based on the specific needs or complex needs of the children. And it is causing uh, a lot of stress to parents. And I did speak with uh, Minister Madigan yesterday and her advisor on it. But I think we need to get clarity on what's actually, what is actually happening. On the ground in my own uh, constituency, there are, are over 50% 50 50 of the schools which were surveyed have less, getting less hours next year than they did last year. About 20% of them will remain as they were last year, and maybe 30% of the schools will get an increase in the hours. The budget is, has remained the same, it's just that the allocation of it has changed. Yet these schools who have lost hours have the same problems next year as they have this year. And there is something amiss in what is going on. And I think it's, it's important that we try and resolve this matter prior to September. Because what we're talking about here is children who need every chance to fulfil their full potential. And if we have schools who have lost up to five hours uh, in special uh, education uh, teaching time, it is a major concern for the school and for their parents. So I would ask that maybe uh, this would be looked at. I know it's a complex issue, and I also know that the CD&Ts, uh, and especially the one we have in Toome, uh, are way behind the curve in doing assessments for, for uh, off children. 
and their, their, their waiting time to get assessments is, is also impacting in all of this. But maybe uh, you would have a look at this and see what we can do to actually improve the system that we have so the schools can retain the staff that they have in order to provide the education that is required for our students. Thank you. Your Deputy Kenny, Taoiseach. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and I want to thank Deputy Kenny for raising this uh, very important issue. Uh, and it's been raised with me by other deputies, uh, including very many here in the government benches. Um, when any change is made to how resources are allocated to schools, uh, it can cause worry for students, for parents, and for the school. Inevitably, when a change is made, uh, there will be schools that gain hours, and there will be schools that lose hours. But that's based on objective criteria, and most importantly, based on the needs of the children uh, in the schools concerned. Special education teachers provide a valuable additional teaching assistance for students with special needs, enrolled in mainstream classes in primary and post-primary schools. For the next school year, starting in September 2024, uh, there will be 14,600 um, special education teachers, a thousand more than uh, at the end of 2021. Um, many more than the entire uh, defence forces at full strength, just to give you the context uh, of the number of special education teachers we now have. Uh, this is reflected in the fact that 98% of all children with special educational needs are now in a mainstream setting. The Department of Education commenced a review of the model in late 2022. It involved consultation with unions, management bodies and schools to hear their views on how things could be done more fairly. There were 30 meetings and 12 consultation sessions. The NCSE took, undertook 40 reviews of individual schools to get their feedback, and the feedback was incorporated into the revised model. The allocation for, for September 24 distributes the total number of SET teachers in line with each school's profile and need across the country. So it's not about the schools, it's about the children who attend them and the needs of those children, and of course that does change from year to year. It ensures that children with the greatest level of need can get access to additional hours and are allocated the greatest level of resource. It's transparent, and the model takes into account a number of factors. These include the total enrolment of the school, complex needs, literacy, numeracy, and disadvantage. Uh, and of all the schools in the country, 67% will either have the same number of hours or gain them. In County Galway specifically, there's been an increase in the number of hours for post-primary schools of 25 but there has been an overall reduction in the case of primary schools of 148. Uh, that is because the number of pupils in primary schools has fallen considerably. 10 schools will have 30 or fewer pupils next year. That's the equivalent of 30 fewer classes of children in Galway uh, next year in primary school, just to give you an example. However, the Minister um, acknowledges that there, that there may be particular issues in particular schools here that need to be looked at. And for that reason, uh, there is now a review process being put in place. Uh, the Minister and I are encouraging any school that has a concern about their allocation uh, to engage with the NCSC so we can see if they can be reviewed upwards or perhaps put a transitional arrangement in place. Schools can make their application for a review from March uh, through to May uh, of each year for a review and the review will be, will be completed before the school ends so they'll know where they stand for September uh, before the school holidays. Thank you, Taoiseach. Deputy Kenny. Uh, thank you, Taoiseach. And I do welcome the fact, and I acknowledge the Minister's work on this, Minister Madigan's work on this, that there will be a, a review and uh, schools will be able to um, look for a review in order to try and uh, get the problem sorted out over there. I acknowledge that. I just want to say again that the worst thing for the schools is that while the support hours are based on certain three criteria, the school then is actually asked to look at how they will allocate their teaching, the special educational tree, uh, train, uh, teaching hours uh, based on the, the complex needs of the children. So I think there is an anomaly there that needs to be looked at. And um, I suppose as a member of the uh, Disability Matters Committee, we come across lots of things uh, that are not what we would call things that I wouldn't be proud of that's happening with disabilities. And I think for sure we need to be able to stitch in what's happening with the HSEs, early diagnosis and early interventions with what's happening in the education sector. And we need, need to do that as a, as a matter of urgency so that we actually give every child uh, the same opportunity and equal opportunity uh, to uh, fulfil their full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Kenny. I want to thank the Deputy again for his contribution. And what's happening here is the amount of resource for special education is increasing. 
but it's shifting from primary to secondary. And that's the right thing to do because that's where the population is moving. So, as I mentioned before, uh, in the county of Galway alone, there'll be 300 fewer children in primary school next year, 10 fewer classes. And of course that means fewer teachers, logically it would. But we're not reducing the number of teachers, we're moving that resource uh, to follow the children uh, into the post-primary er er area, and that's the right thing to do. Just in terms of, uh, of how, how the allocation is weighted, um, baseline the number of enrolments, the size of the school is weighted at 25%. Uh, the weighting in favour of boys has been gotten rid of uh, because that was deemed to be inappropriate uh, in the modern world. Um, disadvantage remains a criterion, and also so does complex needs literacy and numeracy. There has been some suggestion that complex needs isn't taken into account anymore. That's incorrect. However, we're not willing to use the HSE data for complex needs. We will use the education data, but we're not willing to use the HSE data for complex needs anymore because we don't believe it's reliable. Thank you, Tishik. And that concludes leaders' questions and enables us to move to questions of promised legislation. One minute, please, for each question maximum. Deputy Mary Lou MacDonald. Uh, Count Corla, uh, earlier I cited the number of 327 children on waiting lists for scoliosis related surgery. The Thesha challenged me on that matter. I wish to, for the record of the doll, put the correct figure on the record, which is in fact 300. And 33, I'd underestimated. And this is published data from Children's Health Ireland from the 19th of February. Um, uh, Taoiseach, you lost no time in summoning the Russian ambassador to Ireland 